Here we can see short field takeoff distances and the conditions are flaps 10. When we get to the runway we're going to hold the brakes, give it full power and then release the brakes. We're doing this on a paved level dry runway. There's no wind. We're going to lift off at 51 knots and we're going to be over our 50 foot obstacle at 56 knots. Now here we've got that table of data and along the x-axis we can see the changes in temperature and on the y-axis we can see changes in pressure or pressure altitude. And what that gives us here is a value we can look up or interpolate. And we've got on the first column the ground roll and on the second column we've got the feet to clear 50 foot obstacle. Now it says to in the notes to use the short field technique as per section 4 so that's kind of referring us now back to prior information and for fields above 3000 feet pressure altitude the mixture should be leaned to give maximum RPM in a full throttle static run up and so remember we read previously in the other sections that we want to have between 23 to 2400 RPM on run up and on takeoff as we're going down the runway to make sure we're developing the maximum power possible. Here's a very important point. We're going to decrease our distance by 10% for each 9 knots headwind, but we're going to increase our distance by 10% for each 2 knots of tailwind. So let's look at a, a comparison. If I have 9 knots of headwind, my takeoff roll will decrease by 10%. If I have 9 knots of tailwind, my takeoff roll will increase by a staggering 45%. So there's a profound effect that a tailwind has on an aircraft's performance. And if we're doing a short field takeoff, it's very, very likely that we're doing it on a grass strip. And if that's the case, we're going to have to increase our distance by 15%. So let's say we accidentally take off on a short field that's a grass strip with a tailwind. Well now we've got 45% increase in ground roll from the tailwind. We're adding in another 15% because we're on grass. We've suddenly jumped to increasing our required ground roll by 60%. And in a short, in a real short field, uh, not practicing this on a long runway at your local airport, but if you're in the real short field airport out in the woods, that's going to put you into the uh, side of a tree if you don't know what you're doing. So very, very important. Here we can see the same thing but at a lighter weight, and then the same thing again but at even the lighter weight. Here we've got the maximum rate of climb at gross weight. And of course here the same footnote about leaning the mixture for pressure altitudes above 3,000 feet. Here we've got the time, fuel, and distance to climb. And here it's at maximum weight. We can see the change in altitude. And remember it says here sea level 15 degrees. which means we're assuming standard temperature, full throttle, and flaps up during our climb out. And we can see the climb speed the rate of climb in feet per minute, the time it will take, the amount of fuel we will use, and the distance we will travel in that amount of time. This will all change if you have any form of wind, and you always will. It also says to add 1.4 gallons for engine starting, taxiing and takeoff, lean the mixture above 3,000 feet pressure altitude, increase the time, fuel, and distance by 10% for each 10 degrees above standard temperature. And so that's how we can compensate. And then it says distances shown are based on zero wind. Now here we can see cruise performance. We've got along the top again changes in temperature from standard. Notice it doesn't tell you standards 15 degrees Celsius. You got to go back to section one for the definition on that. We've got changes in pressure altitude over here. We've got the engine RPM and then we've got the uh, percent power, the knots true airspeed, not indicated but true, and the fuel burn in gallons per hour. Now the note says 20 or the conditions are maximum takeoff weight and recommended lean mixture. So let's look at the notes and it says maximum cruise power using recommended lean mixture is 75 percent. 
power settings above 75% are listed just for your use in interpolation. Operations above 75% must be done full rich. And here we see cruise speeds are shown for an airplane equipped with speed fairings. Without speed fairings, decrease speeds by two knots. So if you don't have wheel pants, you're going to fly actually slower than what this table says. And most likely the chances are you don't have wheel pants because not very many Cessnas do. <clears throat> Here we can see cruise performance again, but at um, just higher altitudes because we're starting at 8,000 and going up to 12,000. Here's a range profile. So the conditions here are maximum weight, recommended lean mixture, and remember the note said that this will give us 45 minutes reserve time for our destination by default. Here we can see the lines for various uh, power settings starting 75, 65, all the way to 45. The airspeed we should fly at. And notice that the airspeed we should fly at starts to change as we go up in um, altitude. The true airspeed starts to change. And it says that this chart allows for fuel used for engine start, taxi, takeoff, climb, and the distance during a normal climb. And it says cruise speeds are shown for an airplane equipped with speed fairings. Without speed fairings, decrease speeds shown by two knots. And we can see the trade-off. And like your car, if you're going down the highway, it's going to be most efficient when you're going at the highway speed, which is 65 to 55 to 60 miles an hour. The power required increases with the velocity cubed. So the faster you go, the more power, uh, the cubic of more power you're going to require. So you're going to have less and less range if you go faster and faster. So that's why as you start to go slower, if you only go 90 knots, you can stretch out that Cessna to almost 630 nautical miles. If you want to go there fast, you're only going to go about 490 nautical miles. So it's a very big difference. Here we can see the endurance profile. So this is how much time we can stay in the air. Again, with the recommended leaning and maximum gross weight. And it says, again, we allow for fuel for engine start, taxi takeoff, climb, and the time during a normal climb. Here we have short field landing distances. So once we land, we're going to have flaps full, bring the power to idle, maximum braking, no wind, paved level dry runways, and the speed is uh, 50 feet, is going to be 61 knots indicated. Just like before, variations in temperature on the top, variations in uh, pressure altitude along the y-axis, and then the ground roll and the total distance to clear a 50-foot obstacle is on the secondary column. Now, it says to use the short field technique as specified in section 4, and usually what you do is when you touch down, you raise the flaps immediately. That puts more weight on the wheels, and when you apply full brakes, you get maximum coefficient you get more weight on the wheels for a given coefficient of friction and you'll come to a stop the fastest which is a little bit counterintuitive because you would think the flaps would help you slow down more than the brakes but that's not the case now here it says distances decrease by 10 percent for each knot of uh, nine knots of headwind and then again they increase by uh, 10 percent for each two knots of tailwind just like on the takeoff for dry runways um, grass runways, it says increase the distance by 45% for the ground roll. That's a very large difference. And if landing with flaps up, increase the approach speed by 9 knots and allow for 35% longer distances. Again, that is a substantial change in performance. And that's why it's very important to really read these footnotes. And after that we get to section 6 which is weight and balance. That's all there is for the performance. It's really very simple. And I'll show you how to actually implement this on a tutorial when I plan out across country. We'll actually use these charts. And that's it.